Um, the first one of the next part of Romans, I've entitled it How to Walk in Victory, which is interesting because we're only going to do one verse. But in Romans 12, I'll read the first two verses, but it's the first one I want to pick up on. So Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, it says this. This is the New Living Translation. It says, And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be living, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is your true way of worshipping him. And don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will and what his will is for you, his good and pleasing and perfect will. The message version of the Bible, which is a paraphrase, says this. So here's what I want you to do. God's helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you in the best things that he can do for you, that you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to the culture of this world that you fit into everything, into, sorry, into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And then it continues. The NIV says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. And the New King James says this, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by, God's mer by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So, we've read through Romans up to Romans 12 and I encourage you at some point do go back because he starts off with I beseech you therefore or I urge you therefore the word therefore means you're going to look back at what it's there for so you're going to look at all the 11 chapters up to this point the last therefore was in chapter 8 when it says therefore there is now no condemnation and but then you'll start to look at the why there's no condemnation and in light of, or in view of God's mercy, therefore, I plead with you. So Paul's making a plea, and he's saying basically, I've told you the truth, now I'm going to show you how to live the truth. See, chapters um, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 is all about how to live the Christian life. So this is what I was talking about, how to walk in victory, is the next chapters of the book of Romans. The first eight are doctrine, they tell us the truth and, and what we believe. The next three there after 9, 10, 11 talk about Israel's past, present and future. In chapter 12 onwards, it actually starts talking about how to live the life that God's got for us, how to live in victory. So it's going to show us how to live. And we are to live in the light of God's mercies and in the light of what he's done for us. If we don't understand his mercies, then we can't walk in those lights kind of common sense isn't it so he's telling us we've got to walk in the mercies of God there is a difference and this is really what I want to unpack this morning there is a difference between Jesus being our saviour and Jesus being our Lord up to chapter 12 he's been talking about the saving grace of Jesus everything that Jesus has done for us now he's going to talk about walking in the things of God, which means accepting Jesus as our Lord. Now, it used to be, and it, I often try and put this across, but we often talk about, will you accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? Unfortunately, most people take Jesus up as being their Saviour, but they don't really want to as their Lord, because for Jesus to be Lord means we've got to do what he tells us to do. Now, to me, there is no distinction between those, and if he's Saviour, he should be Lord, but it doesn't always work out that way. You see, I got saved, or you could say I became a Christian at the age of about 15, 16. I've told you this before, I went to an house group, they, they, several weeks later, of asking lots of questions. I decided to give my life over to Jesus, and I would, it would be said I became a Christian. I prayed the prayer, I invited him into my life, and I said, Lord, I give you myself. I repent of, I uh, changed my mind, I... I say sorry for all the things I've done and now I want to go your way and it was a lot of fun 
It really was. The church was excited. It was lively. We saw people get saved and healed virtually every Sunday. There were about 160 people in the church or part of the youth group. That was amazing. And things were going really well. It were exciting times. And I remember those exciting times when you first get saved and it seems like the sun shines better and the flowers seem to grow faster and everything's great and wonderful. And life couldn't be better. And then, then things just suddenly turn, don't they? Things don't always go on that way. And you don't know what's really going on, but uh, my mum and dad split up and I stopped with my dad and my mum left, taking half that family with her. My granddad, he died and I found him, he'd shot himself, which is not the uh, most best situations to get yourself into, but I found him. My dad then had a stroke and he fell seriously ill and he's never kind of been right since. The church, went through a couple of splits and the pastor left and it kind of really rocked um, everything that I, I built my life upon at that point. Not Jesus, but the things around Jesus, the youth group, the church and things like that. I ended up being in a church which was 20, couple, 25 people, me and a friend, the four of us our age and everybody else were old, which is fascinating to be in that situation but it was no longer fun but I still got excited about Jesus being my saviour. I ended up working at a nightclub which wasn't good for my health, never mind anybody else's but it kind of did work that way uh, really good but I got to the point that I'd become a Christian and I'd given my life to Jesus and I took hold of Jesus as my saviour but there came a point uh, about just before I was 19 when I decided to make Jesus my Lord which meant I was going to give my whole life to him and regardless of what was going to go on in my life regardless of what happened between that point and the day I died I was going to be sold out for Jesus and not just Jesus my saviour and thank you for the communion and thank you for the cross and thank you that you've saved me and thank you that I'm going to spend eternity with you and not go to hell I decided that I'm going to become the man of God that he created me to be. Which meant I was going to surrender my will and do his will for my life. There's a difference. You see, getting saved is basically getting saved and going to heaven and spending eternity with Jesus. Uh, being with him forever and not going to hell. That's getting saved. That's, that's the important message of the gospel. That's, that's the starting point for everybody who wants to walk with Jesus but then Jesus wants us to walk with him which means making him our Lord and we call Jesus Lord but we often think Jesus is Lord of the universe yes he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings yes he is but he wants to be Lord of our lives yeah. and he wants to be Lord of our will and he wants to be Lord Lord of our emotions and our I wants he wants to be Lord of everything See, salvation is when we accept Jesus into our lives. That's called grace. And that's wonderful. That's amazing. And that's the start of a new chapter in our life. But you know, people live their entire lives after they get saved just in the salvation of God. Which is good. But God's got more. And I've realised over the last few months that I've been talking about things that may be, be different or may not you may not understand it because you're still seeing Jesus as Saviour and I'm talking about Jesus being Lord. And you can't walk in, eventually you've got to make Jesus both Lord and Saviour. However, you can just have him as Saviour. But there's a frustration there and God narrows down our options to the point where we get to that choice where we've got to make him Lord and walk in his ways. And that can take years for some people and for others, now you may be the guys who got saved, that moment you gave your life to Jesus, you said, Jesus, I give you my life, and now you are Lord, and you've been running that way ever since. But it was different for me. I had to go through a journey of discovering that Jesus doesn't just want to be my saviour, he wants to be my Lord as well. Unfortunately as a nation, we've kind of missed the whole, what does it mean for somebody to be Lord? You see, in the Bible times they had emperors and kings, and people who they called Lord, and they they were at the mercy of these people who were lords and kings and emperors, and the emperor in particular could have you killed at any moment. So you make sure you called him Lord, and you did what he said. 
Jesus didn't like that. He's not killing us if we don't do what he says. It might kill us for not doing what he said, but he's not the one doing the killing, if you know how to be. But we miss it because we look at a king like, we could say King Charles now. King Charles has not really got much say in our lives. If we saw him, we'd, we'd be respectful. I hope we'd be respectful. Hopefully we'd do what was right. But at the end of it all, we've lost that sense of logic. I believe that when we all stand before Jesus, when we've given our lives to him, we'll stand before him, we will have a problem not kneeling down. And the Bible tells us that every knee will bow, and it tells us every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all. And Lord of all means Lord of you. If he's Lord of all, so I think it's better to do it now than it is when you stand before him and go, go down on the knee. Because at that point, it will be Lord of all, and there's an expression, no, I can't use that one. <laughs> can't use that one. It will be scary. <laughs> is that all right? That's a nice Sunday morning phrase. <laughs> we won't talk about brown trousers. But we'll just stand before God. You see, many people might say, yes, Johnny, but that's just today and in the early church they didn't have this problem. Listen to this. This is Peter talking. And he says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That sanctify means to set apart. But set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Who's Peter talking to? Believers. So he's talking to believers and he said, sanctify, set apart Christ in your heart. The international version says this, but in your heart, re re revere Jesus as Lord, or Christ as Lord. You see, at that moment when you decide that you're going to make Jesus your Lord, there's no longer many options. You see, before I made Jesus my Lord, I was fighting and I was doing other stuff that is not really Christian. But when I met him Lord, it turned out to be, I've got to go his way regardless. You see, when Jesus is Lord, you're not interested in what other people think or their opinions. It's what the Bible says. I've had a conversation with somebody because they started dating a non-Christian. If Jesus is Lord, that means he can't date a non-Christian. That's not me, that's what the Bible says. So if the Bible says it, the Greek version of that is, suck it up. <laughs> The Bible says you can't sleep around. That's neither Greek nor anything. That's just don't do it. That's what it says. You know, the Bible says all sorts of Sometimes I don't like. But Jesus is my Lord. Therefore, I do what he says. It's his house that we're going to. And it's his rules that we walk in. If you come to my house and walk in with mud on your shoes, I will say, take them off. Well, I don't take my shoes off with anybody's house. Well, you have two choices. You take them off or walk out. It's my rules or get out. You know, as simple as that. In God's house, it's God's rules or we're not allowed in. Now, Jesus is my saviour and that's grace. That's his mercy upon us. But ultimately, God wants us to walk in his will, not in our will. Peter's talking to believers. And the interesting thing is that these believers are Jesus, their saviour, but not as their Lord. If you've ever seen the early church, people always wanted Jesus as their saviour because they needed, they needed salvation, they needed a hope of something of the future because many of them didn't live to past 40. So if you pass 40, you're doing really well. But they still wanted to control their own lives. And that's what it boils down to, guys. Jesus said, I'll be your saviour, but I want to be the Lord. It's up to us whether we say, I want to control my life or Jesus wants to control, or we're we going to give him permission to control our lives. Question, if you control your own life, how's it doing? How's it doing? So, if you've spent the last 30, 40, 50 screwing your life up, why not do something different and say, I've messed it up. I've been saved for so many years, I'm doing all right, Lord, I'm going to heaven, great, but I've messed my life up. Lord, can you make some of my mess? And he goes, of course I can. <laughs> the problem is, when he gets us back on track, guess what we do? We take it back. <laughs> Woohoo, thank you for that. I'll take my own life back if you don't want that. 
He wants us to get in James 5, there's a famous verse, uh, sorry, James 4, verse 7 says this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. I often tell people the problem is people are trying to resist the devil and he's not fleeing because they do not submit to God. The word submit to God literally means to make him Lord. So if you want to resist the devil, the best thing to do is make him Lord. In other words, do his way of doing things, not our way. To make Jesus Lord is actually our act of our will. It's your choice. It's your choice. See, when Jesus is Lord, it doesn't matter what you're going through. Because it's like, I'm a good soldier, I will stand. You know, in the Second World War, there were many battles. But some men were ordered into battle knowing they were not going to come back. Some men fought battles knowing they weren't coming back. And yet they saluted and walked into it and did their best. And for some Christians, when the going's good, everything's happy, and they're praising God and worshipping Him, it's wonderful. As soon as it starts getting a bit rough, or God starts saying something to them, or they read something the Bible they don't like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Jesus, you're my saviour, I've got my ticket, I'm off to heaven. And Jesus said, yes, you are, but I want to be your Lord. Why? Because he's got a plan for your life. Romans 12, verse 1, I've read for, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by God, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul starts off by saying, I appeal to you, or the New King James, I beseech you. To beseech is to grab hold of them, to get somebody's attention, or I plead with you. He's saying now, okay, Jesus is your Savior, I plead with you to make him your Lord. Why? Because of his great mercies for you. Because of the goodness of God, because of everything he's done for you. <coughs> he wants just to pour out his love, and not only for us, his other people he wants to save. And if I'm only interested in me, then I'm not going to be able to reach out to other people. But if I make Jesus my Lord, which means that I've got to walk his path and do his things, and it may be uncomfortable, it may be rough, it may not be easy. Am I selling this one to you? Come to Jesus, it'll all be great. Make him your Lord, and it won't be. In the end it will be. There'll be great rewards waiting. But in the moment it might be tough. We need to surrender our lives to him because of all that he's done. Everything he's done is listed in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And he says to present your bodies as living sacrifices to make Jesus all. In the Old Testament, if you read throughout the Old Testament, there's loads of killings going on. There's animals being slaughtered here and slaughtered. I mean, one day they killed so many, it must have been a, a real lake of blood. They used to slit the throats and drain out the blood and chuck them on, on the fire and burn them. But the, the thing about every sacrifice that went to the altar had in common, they died. Every sacrifice died. They'd slit its throat, drain its blood and throw it on the fire and burn up bits, throw bits away, eat some other stuff. But God is wanting us to be living sacrifices. We often sing songs about coming to the altar. I don't think we know what that means. Oh, come to the altar. And we go, oh, Jesus, Jesus, yes. But it means I'm giving my life to you and surrendering my will to you. So you need to be careful what songs you're singing, because if you're singing them and you're not meaning them, that's called being a liar. And the Bible says there'll be no liars in heaven. I just thought I'd fuck that for you. Best not to sing it next time. Um, but we need to, we come to the altar, but we are living sacrifices. We are not the lambs and sheep and goats of the past. We are living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. The problem with a living sacrifice, when you put it on the altar, it wriggles off. Because we don't want to die. But actually, he's not trying to kill us physically. He's trying to let our will submit to his will. The Bible says, talks about how we should die every day. The Bible also talks about how we should be dead to the past. How many people live with the past shackled around them while they're trying to live today because of what has happened? We need to die to those things and let them go. We need to live in the will of God or the will that God's got for us. That means making him Lord. Matthew 16, 25 says this, For whoever desires to save his life will, will lose it, but whoever loses his life... For my sake, we'll find it. Have you ever wondered 
why I can't find my life, why my life's really boring, why this and why that. Well, maybe you need to lose it for God, which means submitting it to Him. And then Matthew 10, 39 says something similar. If you cling to your life, you will lose it, but if you give it up, if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Contradictory almost. No, he's saying, give it to me and I'll look after it. You know, kids these days, you know, we, we had a toddler group on Friday, it's really funny. And often they bring little toys in. And we often say to them, give them to mum because you're going to lose it. And what happens? They know better. <laughs> but then I know better because about an hour later they're screaming because they've lost it. Give the stupid thing to mum next time. But they don't, they ignore me. <laughs> they ignore, and we have said, but often with us. People give us sometimes good advice and sometimes bad advice. Jesus never gives us any advice other than truth. And his ways are always better. I often say this, that God has a plan for your life, and I stand by that, for I know the plans I have for you, and you can go through that. And if God has got a plan for your life, and it's not just getting saved, it's getting saved and walking in that plan, but to walk in that plan means to submit your will to God. Because you can never fulfill God's plan for your life while you're still in control of your own life. So choose God's way or your way. God's way is going to be the best way, but it may not be the easiest way. He's still saved, he's still going to accept everything's great, but God's way may not be the easiest way, but it will be the best way. God's never promised us an easy life. He, he told us we'd have a joyful life, a life of peace, a joy and stuff like that. But it may be difficult. As Christians, we probably get more hassle, more trouble, because we've got our own physical body causing us problems with its needs. We've got our eyes causing us problems with what we look at. The devil's having a go at us. And then, you know, you've got all the other problems of people around you just having a go. The Bible says this is Psalm 51 verse 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, when you're broken, God will never despise you. When you're, when you're feeling, you know, just crushed. God is looking for people who cry out to him and he'll always pick them up. Because I'll tell you this, when you're at that point, when you've no other options, that's when you say, God, I'm all yours. But you don't have to get there to say I'm all yours. In fact, if you can say I'm all yours before you get there, it's a lot easier. I mean, it took a lot for me to get there and I didn't even know this stuff. I just walked into it quite blindly. Some people, like I said, they get saved and Jesus Lord and everything's, you know, Blossom on trees for the rest of their life, it's great. But for me, it's been, it got a struggle to get me to Jesus to be Lord, it's been a struggle ever since. You know, when you're a teenager, you need to get, guys, you need to be careful what you say, because I used to say all sorts. I was crazy when I was younger, I was. I actually read Revelation, saw the two guys in Revelation, I said, God, I don't know who they are, but if you need a volunteer, I'll volunteer to be one of them witnesses. <laughs> I'll go for it. Not realizing I will be here, but that's besides the point. You know, I used to just say, God, send me anywhere, do anything. I'll, I'll be whatever you want me to be. I said that. And you know what? God says, okay. <laughs> and you know what? I don't regret it. Other people around me might, but I don't. You know, it's been a crazy life. It's been a hard life. But this is, when he says, this, submitting to God, is your spiritual act of worship. You see, worship is more than just standing up in church. You see, in John... Four, verse 23, 24, it says this. Jesus speaking to the woman at well. A time is coming and has now come when true worshippers, believers who worship God, true worshippers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Have you ever wondered what it, spirit and truth means? I mean, it continues. <laughs> spirit and truth. And there are all kinds of worship. So for these are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what's it look like to worship in the spirit? Well, let's look about what it, what it looks like to worship physically. Okay? When we'll compare the two. 
we sung a song early and in the middle of it he did say you know raise your hands up and yeah, it's like eh, eh, eh. do I have to but at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not going to go up people's worship styles but worship on their outside is always a reflection of the internal see for some people they can't, can't get the past they can't get past the fact that God saved them that God's so merciful for them. Sometimes when I get lost in worship, my head goes down. Some people get lost in worship, head raised up. Because I see, I can't grasp all that God's done for me. And it kind of puts me at that point where I just can't cope with it. The more I see the goodness of God, I'm not like that, I'm just like that. Because it's like, who am I that you would do with so much for me? So people's worship is different. So I'm not going to go to people's worship. But these are different styles of worship, okay, for you guys. If you've ever seen this, this is a funny one. The Zozu carry the telly worship. <laughs> and the Zozu just worshiping by, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to John's big screen, big screen, big screen worship. <laughs> there we are, we're just worshiping God. And the Zozu carry the box worship in my car. <laughs> the box, yes, Jesus. And there's those who worship him by the hot pot. <laughs> <laughs> the hot pot, this is good. You know, and there's those people who are liars, but they go, the fish was really this big. <laughs> you know, that's how big it was. But those people who worship by going, all the baby. All the baby worship. If you do this, I'm sorry. You know, all the baby worship. You know, and there's those who do the rugby posts worship. <laughs> And that's fine if you, that's where you're out, you know what I mean? There's those people who, who do the rugby post in the heart. Yes. Yes. And we've got a rock at the same time, haven't we? Yeah. If you do that, sorry, I'll have to go, yeah. yeah. There's those people who do the Lion King. <laughs> Lion King worship, that's really awesome. And there's those who bring in the plane, don't they? Bring the plane in, bring the plane in, yes. There's those people, and there's those that they get really excited to go, Goal worshippers! They're the best out there. And if you're any of those people, go for it. Okay? But when you appreciate all that God's done for you, it's expressed on the outside. Now, if you do, I'm not having to go at anybody. That's just a bit of fun because I know what's coming next. Um, and many people worship in different ways. Some people worship loudly. And they're into that verse that says, shout to the Lord. And they really let rip. Some churches worship with dance and banners and flags and smack each other over the heads with them. So, some church you can go to the give them instruments to, to rattle around with. We do not. You know what I mean? We've, you know, we need to keep on the beats and stuff like that. The last thing you want is a lot of people who are out of beat. And some people dance and wave their arms around and... You know, these are great. Some people just raise their arms up, which is really good, except if you're all crammed in and the person next to you does it, it's kind of loud, especially if you're tall, and pit in your head and you want to smack them back. But some people's worship is candles, darkness, liturgy, and tears. Some is laughter. Some is sternness, seriousness. And none of them are wrong as long as it's done with the right heart. And like I said, worship is just an expression of our heart, but ultimately we need to make Jesus our Lord so that it is our spiritual act of worship. So that's the physical acts of worship. Now there is a difference between praise, uh, and I've tried to find where I wrote this, um, praise is thanking God for all that he's done. Thank you, Jesus, that you've saved me. Thank you, Jesus, that you've done this. You've healed me. You've, you've been there. Thank you that you've, you've never left me. That's all great. That's work. That's called praise. That's when we get excited about. That's when we get the drums going and guitars rattling and, and get you from that bass rattling away. That's great. But when we get into worship, worship is more of looking at God for who he is. Praise. Anybody can praise God. You know that. But only believers can worship him. Where do you get that from, Johnny? We'll look at that in a minute. Because we need to worship in spirit and in truth. And you can't worship in truth. And I say everything that I've talked about, you know, but you're worshiping in truth. Because you're worshiping in the truth of who Jesus is. A lot of us worship you because you're the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I worship you that you just because you're, you're the creator, but you're my creator. 
Lord, I thank you, Lord, that not only do you heal, but I worship you because you're my healer. It's who he is. I thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. That's who he is. His light, his life, his love, he just pours on us. And non-Christians can thank him, but non-Christians can't worship him in truth. But Jesus wants us to not just worship him in truth, he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And worshipping him in spirit is to live your life daily in the will of God. Which means putting Jesus as Lord of your life. Jesus is looking for people who worship in spirit and in truth. And worshipping in truth is the songs that we sing and the, the melodies that we hum and our arms raised up and our hearts just pouring out towards God. But when we worship in the spirit it means walking in the way of the spirit, the will of God. Jesus is our Lord walking in everything that God's done, done for you. You see, often people try to separate the physical and the spiritual, but as believers, we are spiritual beings walking in a physical body. So everything you do is spiritual. Whether it's going to the shop. Yeah, you don't have to act weird. No, you don't have to, Lord Jesus, which blueberries do I need? Them, them, or them? God says, get any. You know, if a cucumber's looking a bit wilty, don't pick that one up, pick the next one. You don't need a, a word from God, but God wants you to walk in his will and according to him being our Lord so that we can walk in spirit and truth. Our spiritual act of worship is when we surrender our will, our lives to Jesus and we say like Jesus did, not my will but yours be done. If Jesus surrendered his will to the Father, then why can't we surrender our will to Jesus? Which means, when you open your Bible and you find something that you don't like, you've got a choice to make. His will or my will. It's all out there for us. Sometimes, I know a guy who got saved years and years ago and he's never been baptised in water. And I said to him a couple of times, why do you get baptised? He goes, it's just a ceremony, I don't need to do it. Yet the Bible says, believe and be baptised. Now, getting baptised don't, get, don't mean you're saved. It's just an outward expression of something that's going on. But you don't see the point in it. But the Bible said, whether I agree or disagree with baptism, it's irrelevant. The Bible says, do it. It doesn't matter what I agree or disagree with, whether you know, people should, or, or should not have sex outside marriage. It's not my opinions that matter. It's what does Jesus say about it. That's what matters. Is it right for people to drink and smoke and do all this? Well, what does the Bible say about these things? Now, you're all curious, aren't you? Well, check it out for yourself. But not, not my <coughs> will, but his will. By the way, it's not wrong with having a drink. Drunkenness is when God's got a problem. So I'll just pull out before, so you can breathe gently now. <sighs> Unless you're drinking Lambrini and it's like, why would you? <laughs> Or white line inside there, you know, it's why. You know? So Jesus wants to be Lord, but he wants to be Lord of everything in us. Not just some bits. One of the reasons we have problems is often because we want Jesus to drive in our car until we think we know better. And we want Jesus as a sat nav. And he says, No, I want to be the driver. Get in the back, enjoy the ride. But we say, I'll drive, you direct. God is not one who gives directly. He does technically, you know. Yes, he does. By the Spirit. But he wants to be the one in control of our lives. So, is he in control of your life? Being your Lord does not, sorry, being your Lord or not does not change who he is. If he's not Lord over your life, he's still your saviour. He's still awesome, he's still amazing. And he's still the Lord of the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords. It doesn't change who he is, but it will change who he is to you. When the Bible talks about, oh, magnify the Lord, we can't make God bigger. We can only see him bigger. Because he's already as big as he can ever be. And when he's Lord of our life, it's like it's the next step of just the awesomeness of God. It took me three or so years to get to that point. And like I said, it's not been easy. And I've run that race and I'm keeping going. But everybody reading the Bible said, Jesus, Lord, except for Peter, who had to have some real encounter because he went, no, Lord. How can he call somebody Lord and no in the same sentence? He can't do it. Yet Paul, sorry, Peter did. 
until he was baptised in the Holy Spirit and he just was put right. Jesus ministered to him on the seashore about loving his sheep and it completely changed it. He never has a question thereafter. Paul totally sold out for God. You now there's other people that are totally sold out for God and Jesus is looking for people who are totally sold out for him and to be totally sold out means I'm going to submit my will to your will. Now he's not going to tell you what to, how to dress. He's not going to tell you all the silly little things that people get uptight about. But he will tell you about the big things in your life. He will tell you about the good things in your life. He is interested in the little things, by the way. You know, he's interested in Dawn getting married, but I don't think he's interested in all the little fiddly things that she's setting up. And stuff. That's a girly thing. Jesus is a guy. He's kind of like, I'll just turn up. You know what I mean? Have a great time. <laughs> but he's wanting to be in everything in our lives. So my question is to you: Will you surrender? I'm, not, I'm talking to people. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. That's the first thing. Talk to you online. The question is though: Will you surrender all to Jesus and make Him the Lord of your life? And I don't mean that in a sense of getting saved. I'm talking to people who are saved who have met him or are walking it and you surrendered some parts of your life is it time just to lay down all your life before him often in our hearts we've got little departments and little areas that we won't let him in how do you know if you don't let him into your life is there some way you won't go and I don't mean physical I often talk to people and they go no, 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 I don't want to talk about that I'm not trying to intrude but if there's an area of your heart you're trying to protect, Jesus said, I want, I want it in there. Yeah. If there's a part of your life that you just walk, no, I don't, I don't want to go there. Jesus goes, but I want to go there. Because when I get there, I'll minister healing in there. And therefore we can walk out of there. I said earlier about some people walk around with their old life still attached to them. Jesus said, I want to go there. Make me your Lord and I will go there and I will get rid of it. The regrets that we've got, we can't do what about Jesus, I want to go there. Let's talk about it, let's put it right, let's leave it in the past. The hurts, let's go there, let's talk about it, let's leave it in the past. I've been betrayed, okay, let's go there. Let's bring healing in there. And let's start a fresh day. You don't need enough, you don't need to take trouble from your past into your present because there's enough trouble ahead of us just to walk in the good things of God it's going to cause us trouble not from him but from others yeah. so will you this morning consider surrendering all to Jesus mm. surrendering everything this is a lineup for the next few weeks if not months as we go through but we can't go into all the other great things God's got for us through Romans mm. unless we're prepared to surrender and that means just laying everything on the altar and saying, God, if it kills me, I'm going to lay down anyway. Even if it hurts, I'm going to lay down. Nobody likes anybody poking their fingers into something that's sore. And sometimes if we have got wounds, it will sometimes feel painful to get it dealt with. Talk about wounds of the heart from last week, if you remember. But ultimately, Jesus wants to minister life so that you can become all that he's got for you. It starts with a decision. We'll get into this next week, a changing of the mind. But it starts with, Lord, I surrender to you this morning. And tomorrow, you know what you have to say? Lord, I surrender to you. And the next day, Lord, I surrender to you. Because the human nature wants to do it our own way. And every day, you've got to remind yourself, Lord, I'm surrendering to you. It's a good job Jesus didn't go, uh, I don't like your will, I'll do my own. Because none of us would have been here. For the joy set before him, it says, he endured the cross, scorned in its shame, and now has sat down at the right hand of the Father. For the joy set before him were us, scorned in its shame, the, the, the filth of mankind put upon it. 
but he did it because of his love. And if he submitted his own will to the Father's will, he's asking us, will we surrender our will and make him Lord of our lives? Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for all that you've done in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the processes you've taken us through. Lord, I pray right now that you'll help us all to surrender our lives to you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, to set before you a living sacrifice and say, whatever, Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, I pray right now for those people listening right now that if they've never given their life to Jesus, Lord, you'll speak to their hearts. And for all those who have, Lord, I pray that you'll remind us daily that we've said we're going to surrender our lives to you. That we may walk in your ways, according to your plans, and doing your will. For your glory and in your name, Jesus. Amen.